Alrighty, so today we're going to be taking a look at Git hooks. Um, Git hooks are probably one of the most underutilized features that Git has to offer. Uh, you might not even know they exist, or if you knew they exist, you might not have a practical use for them. But really, it's the best or easiest way to get into automating things when events happen in Git. Um, there are all kinds of hooks. Uh, the really cool thing, right, since Git is this sort of decentralized platform, uh, there are local hooks and remote hooks. Today, I'm going to show you my three favorite local hooks for doing all kinds of things in my project directory as I check out things or commit things or, you know, stuff like that. Um, we'll go ahead and get into it in a second here, but here's the man page, you know, as usual. You want to take a look at this to see what you can do with it, basically. There's all kinds of capabilities. Uh, you have all of these different options down here based on when you want actions to run. Think about a Git hook as basically a trigger for running a shell script when something happens. And that something could be after a commit has been made, um, before a rebase is carried out, for example. Uh, there are all kinds of others, like before you actually receive things, uh, like if you're going to do a fetch, for example. So lots of lots of options here, lots of cool things you can do with it. But here are some examples to maybe get you started. So I have this sample project over here. We've used this a couple of times. Uh, it's this very basic adding two numbers together library in Rust, right? And again, Git hooks, it doesn't matter what language you're using or what your project is, it's generic over top of that. You can run anything you want to. Um, but I'm just going to be using this Rust project for the sake of this demonstration. So if I run my tests, you can see that they're passing. Two and two makes four, that sort of thing. Everything works great. So how do you actually create a hook? Um, it's all documented inside of the man page here, but basically inside every project, if you do an ls-a to see everything, including the hidden folders, you of course have your little git directory in here. Inside of that git directory, you have this directory called hooks. Inside of hooks, you basically put whatever scripts you want to run, and you name them after all of the events that you see here in the man page. And what Git's going to do is it's going to look in that directory for scripts, which are executable, which match those names, and it's going to run them using the interpreter that you provide. Uh, so when I say the interpreter pro to that you provide, of course, I'm talking about like if you write a bash script, uh, you're going to basically have a text file which has the shebang at the top to say, you know, hash bang slash bin slash bash or slash bin slash sh for a POSIX shell script. You can also use Python. You can use PHP or Perl, uh, whatever you want, really. Uh, if you're on Windows, I'm sure you can use batch scripts uh, or PowerShell scripts or things like that. Uh, it, the world's your oyster. But I'm going to go ahead and write some very simple shell scripts for this exercise. So let's go ahead and start. I think the one that I want to start with is pre-commit. Let's go ahead and find that in the manual here. Here it is. This hook is invoked by git commit. Uh, pretty obvious. Uh, basically, when you run git commit, it's going to run whatever script you have inside of hooks that's called pre-commit. And it's going to do that before it actually carries out the rest of the committing operation. Uh, so this is really useful if you had like uh, unit tests, for example, and just for your own sanity, you wanted to make sure that all of your unit tests are passing before you commit something. Uh, this is not something that you would want to use as repository rules for like a dev team. Uh, these hooks aren't going to go to somebody else's system when you check in or check out or push or pull the project. Uh, they're mainly just for you. That's that's remote hooks, and we can look at that later. But uh, this is going to be stuff to help you out. So let's say that I want to do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a hook in .git hooks, and we're going to call it uh, pre-commit. Uh, and inside here, I can put whatever I want. Uh, I'm going to use a very basic POSIX shell script. So i got to put my little shebang at the top. Uh, and let's say, because this is a uh, REST project, that I want to run cargo test every single time I commit. And uh, the cool thing about the way that these scripts work is if they have a non-zero as exit code, so if they exit with an error status, Git will fail the pipeline. It will not continue with the commit operation if your script fails. So in this case, I can say, um, I can basically just use cargo test just as it is. It returns a non-zero code if your tests fail. 
Uh, and what that means is I can't commit if my tests are not passing, uh, unless I go and change the hook, of course, or I skip it with uh, the no verify option. But let's go ahead and test this out just to see how it works. So I've got cargo test in here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, save this. Uh, I'll probably leave that as is. I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, we'll go into my library now, and let's add a test that fails just to see what that looks like. So let's write a test called threes. Uh, we're going to assert equals adding three and three together, and we're going to assert that that is seven. We know it's not seven, but we want to make a test that fails. So if I save that, uh, and I go ahead and run my uh, cargo test here. There you go. Tests are failing. Great. So now I've forgotten your crucial step. And this is very important, of course. You have to mark those scripts as executable. Uh, if I ls-l my .git hooks, you can see that there is no write bit, or excuse me, no execute bit. Uh, on this pre-commit script. So always remember to shamad your script or it isn't going to work. Uh, git hooks and pre-commit. Now if I run my ls-l again, you can see it's executable by everybody. Perfect. Now I can go ahead and do an actual commit. So let's add everything in the project. We'll do git status, take a look at what that looks like. Uh, looks like it's my initial commit. I haven't checked anything in before. And let's go ahead and commit and let's give it threes as the commit message. We'll go ahead and run that. Uh, and as you can see, it looks like our hook is working because it immediately decided I'm going to run unit tests. Uh, it ran cargo tests, and I can see it ran two tests. One of them failed. Uh, this is all being spat out by cargo, of course, not git. Uh, and then that's it. That's the end. And if I go and look at my git status, it didn't actually commit anything. It ran my tests, they didn't pass, it returned a non-zero exit code, my hook failed, and therefore it failed to commit. Uh, really, really useful. You can do all kinds of things with this. Um, if you have like a disk folder and you're going to actually build assets that need to be pushed up and included in your repository, this is one way of ensuring that that's done for you every single time. If you have like a make file, you could be running the things in your make file and making sure that targets exist where they're supposed to be. Uh, let's go ahead and see what this looks like when it passes. So let me go back, fix my unit test. Obviously, things aren't working right. Three and three is six. Save that. Uh, now let's try to commit with the same message again. As you can see, it compiled my project. It tested it. All the tests passed. And then I see Git saying, OK, I went ahead and tracked your changes with a commit. And if I type git log, there it is. I can see my commit in here. So there's there's your first example, right? Pre-commit, really useful way of running anything you want, basically, inside of a script, any command on your system uh, to build, test, check, do whatever you need to do before you actually complete committing to your project. So that's pretty useful. There are lots of other cool things you can do. Another thing that I like to do is customizing commit messages. Uh, you might have a project where you have like a bug tracker, uh, like Jira, for example, or an issue tracker, and you want to include information about the issue you're working on inside of all of your commit logs. You might not want to type that in every single time, uh, but when you're going back through the history in the log later, it makes it really easy to find things. So, for example, let's say that I wanted the results of the unit tests which I just ran before I commit to actually be included in the commit message. So picture every single commit that you have in your log having the results of the unit tests at the time that, that commit was made. Super helpful way of remembering, OK, yeah, it must have been passing at that point in time. Uh, so let's go ahead and try that out. So the hook that I'm going to use for that is prepare, let me see, prepare commit MSG, or prepare commit message. So again, it's invoked by git commit but it's going to do that right after it prepares that default log message. So uh, the way Git kind of works is when you do a commit and you don't provide the message on the command line, it creates a temporary file, pre-populates it with some text, right? Usually it includes that commented section at the bottom telling you what's actually going to be done, what operations are being carried out, and then it gives you a chance to write something in there. So this is going to do that for me. Basically, after it prepares that message, uh, it's going to 
give me the ability to write things in it with my hook. And as you can see, hooks are pretty powerful because they have the ability to take parameters and actually return data as well. So the first argument to this prepare commit message hook, whatever you write, arg1 is going to be the name of the temporary file uh, where the commit message is going to go. Uh, that gives you the ability to go and open that file, write to it, do things with it, whatever you got to do. Uh, and then it will be presented to um, the person actually doing the commit or you know yourself so that you can update your regular typical commit message. So let's go ahead and try this out. Let's go ahead and go back into .git, hooks, prepare, commit, msg. And again, I'm going to write a very basic POSIX shell script. So slash bin slash sh is my interpreter. Uh, and then let's go ahead and do something a little more interesting with cargo here. Now, you don't have to know how cargo works. That's totally fine. Uh, think of it as any unit testing framework out there. You've got these options to control what tests you run and what the output looks like. All I'm interested in here is uh, quiet which minimizes the amount of output. I don't necessarily want to make my commit messages really huge. So I'm going to include that option, cargo test dash dash quiet. Uh, and then there's one other option in here that I want to include, and that is, uh, let me see, should be in here somewhere. Here we go, dash dash tests, test all tests. So by default, uh, cargo test only runs tests with code that has changed since the last time you ran it. But for this scenario, I want to include the output of every single test inside of my commit message. So a little bit less data with dash dash quiet, a little bit more data with dash dash tests. And there we go. Now I need to actually do something with this, right? Remember before I said, you're given an argument for where that file is. It doesn't just read the output of whatever this is. You have to actually manipulate that file. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to append that to $1, which in any shell script is just the first argument, basically. So the file name that gets passed to me, uh, here you go. The first argument is the name of the file that contains the log message. I'm going to append the output of my cargo test to that file. Pretty straightforward. So we'll save that. Don't forget to shamat it. It's really easy to forget to change the permissions on it. There we go prepare commit message. Okay, now we need to actually have something to commit. So let's go back into our library and let's add some more fake code. This time we're going to test fours and let's go ahead and say add four, four, those things make eight and we'll save that. There we go. Now we have another test in here and if I run it get status, we see that we have some changes which haven't been staged yet. Let's get commit dash A. So I'm going to add all of my files to the commit, but I'm not going to provide a message here. We'll go ahead and see what happens. Okay, so you probably saw it in the brief moment that it was on screen, but my unit tests were running from my pre-commit hook, right? And now here's my default commit message. Um, but on the bottom here, I actually have my unit tests, uh, the results of my unit tests. And as you can see, uh, it ran three tests and all of them passed. So the results of all of my unit tests are being included with every single commit message I make. I am now testing fours is the plain Jane top line message that I want to include. I can save that. And now I've made my commit. And if I go and run a git log, as you can see, all the comments got stripped out as always, but my top line is I'm now testing fours. And then in my commit log, I have the results of the unit test at that point in time. Pretty useful. Uh, you could probably think of even more useful things to do with that. That's just one example. Um, and the astute among you probably noticed that I'm running cargo test twice, right? I'm running it for the pre-commit and for the prepared commit message. Probably only need to be doing that once, but this is just a uh, an example. You obviously could get really clever with optimizing this. So there's another example of something cool you can do. Now the last local commit hook, so the client commit hook on this end that I want to show you is uh, the post checkout. And let's go ahead and take a look at our man page here. Post checkout is invoked when a git checkout or git switch is run after it updates the work tree. So if you run git checkout and then the name of a branch, 
it will check you out to that branch, and then it will run this hook. I use this for a lot of stuff. Uh, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but this can be a remote hook as well. Um, uh, or you can use it in the style of a remote hook where you actually check out your project to a different location almost as a backup every time that something gets pushed to it. We're not going to get into that in this video, but one of the things that I will show you here is, uh, let's say you have a bunch of generated assets um, or you have a target directory where all of the object files uh, are spat out when you run a compiler, for example. You might decide, I have to recompile my project or recheck my project or relint my project every single time that I check out somebody else's code. I might as well have a hook that does that for me. So for the sake of this scenario, let's say that every time I check out a new branch or somebody else's branch, I want to clean my work directory. I want to remove any old debugging assets or artifacts or object files that I had from my previous code base. Um, now I'm checking out somebody else's code, and I don't want to have any of those stale artifacts. If I was to run them, they'd be running old code, and I never want to make that mistake. So I'm going to help myself. I'm going to automate it. So let's go ahead and try that. I'm going to make a new hook. I'm going to get hooks, and we're going to add one called post checkout. There we go. It's going to be another shell script, because I love shell scripts. Uh, and now we're going to use whatever commands you're going to use for your project, right? In this case, it's a Rust project. So we're going to run cargo clean. And if we look at cargo clean, basically all it does is any of the things that inside of this target directory, it cleans it up for you. Uh, by default, it will clean up everything, including third-party dependencies. I'm going to change it up a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say cargo clean. And I want it to be quiet. I don't need to see the output every single time. That's fine. There might be a big, long list of things. And then I'm going to say dash dash package. And I'm going to provide the name of my current project, which is hooks. This is going to be the name of you know whatever your project is. Um, it's not hooks because I'm using Git hooks. That's just the name of the projects for the title of this video. Uh, but what that's going to do is it's only going to clean the build artifacts for my project. Uh, it's not going to clean up any of the dependencies that I've pulled from online. Uh, you could think of this as like uh, with NPM, right? You don't necessarily want to delete everything in node modules every single time you rebuild the project. So that's what I'm going to do here. Cargo clean, quiet, and the packages hooks are the name of my current project. We'll save that. We'll shamat it. See, there's only one thing in here to execute on. Perfect. Now it's post checkout, so it's not going to run until we go and check out something. So if we look at our branches, we're on master right now. Uh, let's go ahead and just as an example, let's check out and create a new branch called dev. Alrighty. And how do we know that it worked, right? We told it to be quiet. We might not necessarily know that anything happened. So down here, let's look at our target directory. As you can see, I don't have anything in here called hooks.exe, right? <laughs> or just hooks, a binary that can be run, which would be generated by my project. If I went and ran cargo test again, see it recompiled everything, and then I go and look at everything inside of target, I've got all kinds of information in here. I've got all these incremental object files and things like that. These are the assets that I wanted to remove. Now, if I go and check out master again, Let's say I did some work on this branch and I was going to check out somebody else's branch. Now let's go and find everything that's in this directory. And you can see all those incremental build files are gone. So now I've automated that away. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Anytime that I switch branches and I know the source code is going to be changing, I'm going to force myself to rebuild the project. Uh, if I wanted to, instead of cleaning, I could just fully rebuild the project. Um, but that takes us a little bit longer. In this case, I just want to make sure that I'm cleaning up I can't run a debugger on an old asset. I have to go and manually rebuild it. So it's good enough to save my own sanity. So Git hooks are really, really cool, really, really useful. There's a lot of cool things in here you can do with it. I haven't even touched most of these, um, but I'm sure you're going to find something in here cool to do with them. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Hopefully you make Git hooks a part of your workflow. It's a slightly more advanced Git feature, I guess. Maybe it's just a more unknown Git feature, but uh, I'm Adam with Carpenter Tutoring. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have ideas, cool things that you do with the hooks, post them in the comments. I'd love to check them out. Hopefully this helps. Catch you later.